we've never really dived into the world of racing on this show. And today, we're going to be seeing the world of racing from a different perspective. We're bringing on Bill Barnett from episode 173. He's coming back on to talk about his experience as a member of a pit crew for Indy Racing. We get to get all the insight, talking about what it was like to be there, the practices they went through, what he learned, his favorite venues, and a lot more. You do not want to miss this episode of the Game Time Guru. So, what time is it? Game Time Guru! This is the Game Time Guru podcast, where I interview sports figures from all over the world to help deliver a panoramic view on sports. So whether you're a former athlete, one of the crazies, or simply a casual sports fan, this is the perfect show for you as we peel back the curtains and learn from our guests every single week. I'm your host, Shane Larson, and I'm helping you see sports through a different lens. What's up, everybody? Welcome out to another episode of the Game Time Guru Podcast. I am Shane Larson, your host, and uh, man, what a what an amazing opportunity to be here with you guys today. This is uh, the number 200, yeah, 200th episode, I should say. Yes. Number 200. We have gotten to the 200 level. I, I can't even explain how excited I am for that. Uh, I've been looking forward to this particular interview because... For all the listeners out there, whether you're new to the show, like if this is your first time listening because you thought this was going to be an interesting interview, or if you've been listening for a long time, I mean, I just want to say thank you. This has been a work in progress, four and a half years of consistently pushing out content, uh, meeting new people, and hearing new stories and delivering a panoramic view on sports. And so we've made it four and a half years, and we're at the uh, the 200 level for the episode, um, for the episodes, and we're just really, really excited to uh, bring this information, this, this content, this show to you guys. And today... We're bringing on a guest who has been with us in the past, episode 173 with Bill Barnett. We were talking about his football journey, but in that interview, Bill actually had referenced a few things in regards to being a member of a pit crew, talking a little bit about indie racing, and now we're going to dive deeper into that because in that interview in episode 173, which I would encourage you guys to go listen to, I'll link it here, we talked about his football journey, you know, playing college football for one of the most you know, well-known, famous coaches in the history of college football. But today, we want to dive deeper into this subject and unbox it a little bit more. So, Bill, thanks for coming back to the show and being willing to, to join hey, me again, man. Absolutely. My pleasure. And congrats. So awesome, Shane. 200, man. And what an honor for it to, uh, to be here on the, the 200th celebration. So, uh, very, very tickled, sir. Thank you for having me. Oh, I appreciate you, man. It's it's an honor to have you with me. It's, this is awesome. Um, so, so Bill, we're gonna go into this. Um, dive right into it. The the pit crew story. Yeah. Talk to us about the background of. Okay, you're you were a football player. You had traditional sports, but you did have some experience with the indie racing. So, yep. talk to us about how you even got into that in the first place. Have you been into indie racing your whole life, or was this just an opportunity that you said, "Hey, I want to get into it." Both. Uh, growing up, uh, now I grew up a NASCAR fan and and uh, knew a whole lot of the Alabama gang. Uh, Bobby Allison, Davey Allison, Neil Bonnet knew all those guys growing up. Davey Allison, Clifford. Um, my dad had a chain of shoe stores and our main store was about two blocks down the street from Bobby Allison's uh, shop in Hueytown, Alabama. The the center of the Alabama gang, as they were known back in the 70s and 80s. And and so I grew up around uh, NASCAR. My uncle was Bobby Allison's first sponsor uh, into NASCAR. So I always grew up around racing. But the only thing that my dad did that wasn't IndyCar, on Memorial Day weekend, every year growing up, the world stopped. And sometimes we'd listen to it on the radio. Other times we'd watch it on TV. But was Indy 500 on that Memorial Sunday. And I remember uh, times where we'd be out in the backyard, my dad barbecuing, he had this uh, little uh, leather bound transistor radio. We were living in Mississippi and we were listening to WVOK out of Birmingham, Alabama and listening to the Indy 500. So it was always a very special thing that my dad and I shared. And that was really all I ever paid any attention to. And then years later, so you fast forward past Alabama, past uh, football. I'm, I've been in doing real estate for years. And they opened the ballpark in Arlington where the Texas Rangers used to play ball. They have a new 
uh, stadium now. But they opened a, a stadium in 94, and for the first uh, 14 years or so, I was out there. And I met this guy who was an attorney, and he was a sports attorney, a guy named John Lopes. And he worked for a, a company that did a lot of basketball stuff, a, an attorney firm. And they were one of the firms that represented the Mavericks. And, and he was a young guy and, and a very secondary guy, but he was uh, his whole deal was sports. So he and I started going to some NASCAR races together and just having a blast. And about a year and a half later, he and I had become really good friends. Uh, he called me one day and said, hey, we need to go to lunch. I got some news I want to tell you. Okay, okay fine. We go to lunch and he says, you're not going to believe this. I've been hired by a businessman out of Phoenix to start an IndyCar team. And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? Because I'm going to run the team. I've been hired to be a manager. Now, John was uh, not only was he a great uh, attorney, but he was a, a helicopter pilot in the Army, a West Point grad. Uh, he was, still is, I'm sure, a leader of men. Uh, and I was like, oh, man, that is so cool. So we're, we're yakking. And, and through the course of lunch, I went, John, anything I can do, you let me know I'm in. Don't care what it is, I'm in. He goes, well, what can you do? And I'm like, well, if it's got in, involves turning a wrench, you don't want me anywhere close to the car. I'm not that guy. <laughs> so we went on. Uh, nothing really worked out. They did the first race down in Orlando at Homestead in Orlando. This would have been the 1999 season. And the only airtime our car got was John Hollinsworth Jr. was our driver. He was a rookie. And he wrecked with about 10 laps left to go. And that's the only airtime that we got. And nice. so when they they ended up having to, uh, a lot of times in IndyCar, the wrecker will literally just lift the car. They, they hook it on a pad and, and lift it right up and carry the whole thing off instead of dragging it. And that's the only airtime we got. So probably the next Tuesday, I get a call from John and he said, I, I've been thinking about this. Do you know PR? And I said, oh, Johnny. I've been doing PR since I came out of the womb, brother. What are you thinking? He goes, well, obviously we need help. Uh, what we were doing was not working. Our sponsors are not happy. And uh, I said, you bet you I can do that. I said, now, the problem is you can't afford me. He's like, what? I'm like, dude, you, you can't afford what I would cost to take time away from my real estate business to do that. And he's like, just he was crestfallen. He was like, oh, man. I said, I didn't say you couldn't have me said, you couldn't afford me. If you want me, here's the deal. I'll come in at your rate, but I'm a member of the crew. He said, well, uh, I don't know if I can do that or not. I need to talk to the owner. And we got back to that, well, what can you do thing? I went, that kind of sounds like that's more your problem, not my problem. <laughs> and uh, the next day he calls and he said, got it figured out. Every crew has a guy in the pits, a live pit crew member, He's referred to as the sign guy. He holds a sign out to show the car where to stop in the pit stall. Because if you go over in your stall, you get penalized. If you're short in your stall, you get penalized. And he said, you can do that. And I'm like, you bet I could do that. So uh, I literally, we were in Phoenix the next week for race number two. And then so through that season and the next season, uh, I did IndyCar racing every weekend. The third season came up is when my uh, relationship with Robert Allen really took off. And, and so I had to, to back off of that because I was speaking every weekend for uh, 42 weekends out of the year for the next eight years. And, uh, but that's how that thing got started. Uh, my ex was like, why in the world would you even want to do that? And I'm like, are you kidding? I said, I, I, I had this, nagging emptiness that at some point in my life, I didn't know where it was going to be. I wanted to be part of the team again. Um, I've coached a lot, but being part of the team and coaching a team are, are different, as you well know. And I wanted to be part of the team. Well, in IndyCar, there are 33 teams. There are 16 guys on a team. So that's a very small number of people uh, and I was like, OK, I'm pretty fired up. I'm, I'm now back part of the team playing at the highest level. And uh, such an incredible treat. 
That is so cool how you even got there, right? And I, and I love what you said, Bill, here. One of the things was like, you can't afford me. Um, you were you were working the system like you were you're a businessman. And so like, I mean, you knew what you wanted to do, but you, you you let them know. And, you know, you're playing hard to get basically, you know, like, OK, here's the deal. And you worked your way into the crew, which I think is super cool yep. uh, the way that, that you did it. Uh, the whole concept of team. This is what a lot of people don't understand, including myself to a, a to the high degree. Right. Like I understand the basic level, but like Indy car racing, NASCAR racing, any car racing sport people don't realize the teamwork that goes behind it and that's why i'm actually really excited to kind of break this down a little bit more about the the pit crew like the crew itself and like what goes on behind yeah. the scenes you get to see the racer and i kind of want to see that too like a little bit more about what you know about the drivers mm -hmm. and what they have to go through for training but you know if you ever go on to it, what's intriguing to me bill is i i've gone on to like google and stuff and i've, I've watched videos on the quote-unquote anatomy of a pit crew and they'll show like the eight to 11 different pieces that go into like what's going on when the car stops. Mm -hmm. But talk to me about this, the teamwork. Um, do you guys have to practice or do, yeah. I mean, like how does that work for being in a pit crew? Do you practice and, and do you get scored? Like, is there like somebody who's like a coach who's watching over you guys talk to us about how that goes? Because when you see a car fly off into the pit, I mean, it's fractions of a second can make a difference yeah. in a race. Like you've got to get in and out. So talk to us about that, the, well, the, the different pieces. Remember how long ago that was. And we were doing uh, four tires and 35 gallons of methanol. And we were doing it in 12 seconds. Now they're doing it in eight, nine seconds. Um, but yeah, and, and it's a, um, a manual jack. Uh, so they don't, uh, F1 has hydraulic jacks built in the car. IndyCar doesn't do that. Uh, so there is uh, you have to practice. Uh, you've got to know your way around the car. So I, I quickly moved from just doing the sign uh, to the, the pit crew or the crew manager came to me and he said, hey, uh, each of the tire guys has a, um, a person assigned to them to pull their uh, their air gun back over the wall. Because if an, if an air gun, an air hose gets run over, that's a lap penalty and, and you're basically done for the race. So the guy that I was uh, in charge of was the manager. He was the, the right front tire changer. So he would change that tire. He would hold the car till everything else was done. Fuel's finished, any wing adjustments done. And all four guys on the tires or the other three guys have given him thumbs up. They're done. And then he shoots the guy out. Well, I would pull his, his uh, air gun back. And then I was also the replacement nose guy. And so if we ever, and when this only happened once, but you have a, the nose cone has the front wing on it and it has about eight or 10 uh, screws that are around it that are pretty good size. And you pop that nose cone off and put a new one on and, and do it. And, and they, we were able to replace the, the nose and front wing in about 16 seconds. Um, and they're, we have it with a little glue on each of them. So they stay in the hole. They don't fall off while you're, passing the thing around. And so, yeah, you have to practice. So literally we were practicing at the shop and then in, at IndyCar and, and any of the other races, you have uh, practice time for when you're out just running uh, before the race, you get practice time on the track. But we also, as everybody else did as well, we would also have practice time in the pit where literally your guy just goes, he makes one lap, comes in and you run a hot pit. Uh, you run, boom, we may not actually be putting fuel in the car because it's it's uh, full already, but right. we're changing the tires, we're adjusting wings, uh, we're making sure that uh, another thing you have to do is, is give your driver a drink of water during that time. Uh, so we're doing all of those things, and you've got a timer there, and then you've got the team manager, that's your coach. The team manager is the guy there, he's looking at, uh, is everybody operating smoothly? Was there a, a split second that anybody hesitated on what they were supposed to do? Uh, and he's the guy that's really coaching and he has a timer and this is okay. Uh, that was 11.3. That was 12.2. And we were always looking at what is the one thing that we can do that will shave a tenth of a second off of a pit stop? Because uh, when you're going 200 miles an hour, a tenth of a second, um, it's about 50 yards. 
So uh, it makes a difference. Wow. That's actually a really interesting point that you just brought up there. Uh, it could be 50 yards. Like people, that's what I'm saying is like the casual fan or somebody who doesn't even pay attention much. They'll catch it on TV every once in a while. Yeah. That right there, just I hope that shed some light as to like why that's so important to get those fractions of a second, like yep. get them quicker. Now, here's the deal. I, I always get like anxiety when the pit crew jumps out. Okay. So I can't even imagine being a member of the pit crew because there's a lot of pressure on your shoulders. Yeah. yeah the driver is like the main piece. Like everyone's the, that's where the media is talking. The media's commentators are always talking about the drivers, driver, driver. That's the face yeah. of it. Right. But there, the anxiety is like, you know, the pressure's on the, the pit crew. Did you, was there like anxiety when the car's coming up? Like, did you have to take a oh, deep yeah. breath and realize like, okay, here we go. Ready. And, and how in, in those pressure situations, it's 12 seconds, right? So 12 seconds or less, I should say. How did you, I guess maybe this would be applicable to any sport for that matter or anything that you're doing in life. How did you get yourself to like, okay, heart's racing, you're ready to go, but you've got to focus and you've got to slow things down. Is there anything you did in particular, Bill, that, or is it just kind of go with it and learn how to do it and just slow things down? Yeah, um, and I'm going to tell you, the, the second year they asked me to hit up the fuel team, which meant uh, I controlled the amount of fuel that went into the car. Uh, so we gave the sign off to a new guy. Uh, we had a, a guy retire, and he was our uh, – there's two guys on the fuel team. There's the guy that controls the amount of fuel going into the car, and then there's the guy that's over the wall. He's got the fuel nozzle in the car. Uh, so I took over as the amount of fuel getting into the car. And so pressure by, jumps up big time. But when you, you practice all of that, uh, and this is uh, one of the things I love about Coach Saban in Alabama – uh, I heard an interview with him where he said, hey, you know what? Uh, somebody said, how come you, you, you practice something uh, over and over and over so you get it right? He goes, no, we don't practice to get it right. We practice so much that we can't get it wrong. And I was like, man, that's racing to a T. So when you get to that point that – and you've got a helmet on and you got um, – We've got radio communications going on now. Only a couple of people can speak to the driver, but all of us could hear all of the communication. So the pit crew manager or the, the team manager would come on and, and uh, he said, hey, uh, next time around we're pitting. Uh, when I was on sign crew, about half a lap before the pit, I would already be in place with the sign. And as soon as the driver starts to hit turn four, I'm waving the sign up and down so it makes it easy for him to see the sign. Uh, and then as he starts coming in, you hold it steady and low because literally the nose of the car comes up and touches the sign. Then it's out of the way, and then you're you're pulling the air hose for the air gun. Uh, so in the fuel thing, way different. It was you couldn't start the fuel flow till – uh, the guy was going over the wall, and there was a split second between he's about to insert the nozzle into the car, and you need to get the fuel in the line. And it's a four inch, like a fire hose. It's uh, what they use for aircraft, um, for airplanes and fighter jets and stuff. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, it was you practice it so much that as soon as you hear it on the radio, you go, but just like if you're playing baseball and a guy's about to throw a pitch to you, you exhale to relax, but it, you also get keenly focused and then you've got, and it's over like that. Yeah, I mean, you just, uh, you know, if you watch a football play, it's the moment the ball is snapped. Well, that play may be four or five seconds and that's about it. For baseball, every time a pitch is thrown, it's a nanosecond. And it's the same thing in, in racing. They make the call and you just exhale and, and it increases your focus. And then the car's coming in and, and you're just lasered on, this is what my job is. Uh, and that old, uh, the old thing that you had one job to do, that's all it's like, all I've got to do, my job is this. Uh, and I want to make sure that I'm absolutely perfect doing the best that can be done on this one thing for this next 10 to 12 seconds. Man, uh, the exhale piece of that too, I think that's something that a lot of athletes anywhere can actually take into yep. effect right there because, you know, you'll see a lot of people in basketball, for example, when they're shooting free throws, high pressure situation, uh, they're, they're already breathing hard because they're working hard, but the best way to do it, I always tell them like, yep. all right, and boxing is the same way. My, my coaches always used to tell me even in the middle of the fight, not just in the corner at, at, at the stuff, like in, in between rounds, they would tell us like, 
take your deep exhale, like inhale and then exhale and like slow things down and you'll be just fine. Like a lot of people just, yep. they need to focus and that. And I think that's huge. And just hearing that I, I do have a follow-up question to this though. Okay. So you practice, so you can't get it wrong. Quoting coach Saban. Were there times though, Bill, even with the, I guess maybe in your situation or on your crew that you were a part of, did you guys get it wrong? I guess. I don't yeah, know how to explain absolutely. it. Like the hose, maybe the, the, the fuel went too quick. So it no. didn't out, or the, the tire didn't get on quick enough or it didn't get yeah. tightened or I don't know. Was, was there anything and in, in, can you expand upon any stories there? Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Lord. I was never involved in any of that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we had a driver, um, not at the Indy 500, but a, at a race leaving the pit, stall the car. Um, and it's not like you're passing the car. You just don't reach over and turn the key and it starts again. Uh, we In IndyCar, they actually have a starter that is an external starter that you insert into the gearbox. So if a driver stalls the car, it's a major to do. It may cost you 10, 15 seconds. Uh, it's a big deal. So we, we had that happen once. Uh, I, was, I don't remember who the driver is, but I was literally watching this year's Indy 500. And uh, a guy was uh, a young driver. I think it was his second year, but he was leading the race comes in for a pit stop. There's maybe 30, 40 laps left, uh, gets his four tires, fuel, boom, heads out. And as he's leaving the pits, there's what's called the blend lane. And that's a big curve so that as you come out of the pits, you just don't jump onto the track. You blend into traffic. So it goes um, about halfway around the track almost. But he's going into the, uh, the curve into turn one in the blend lane, and his left rear tire just comes off. Oh, and no. they just didn't. It's a single hub deal. Yeah. So it's not like um, bolts, lug nuts that you use on your car. It's a single hub zoop in and they just didn't get it uh, secured correctly and cost him the entire race. Uh, you know, and not only did it come off, cost him the win, messed his car up and he's out. And uh, so those things happened. We were incredibly blessed. Um, we did have a nose incident where we had to change uh, the nose one time. And um, I, I, that, um, that was the most intense, uh, I think, because changing the nose, we, we practiced about 10% of the time that we practiced. It just didn't happen very once. It happened once in two seasons. Uh, but, yeah, so uh, those things happen. Uh, and it just is one of those things. But probably the most common thing in IndyCar uh, is a driver stalling the car when he's leaving the pits. Uh, that did happen to us, and uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. So those guys have to be uh, – they're even more focused uh, than the rest of us are because they've got to have that focus for hours at a time. We've got it for these terrorizing short bursts of uh, a few seconds, but those guys have uh, an amazing ability to, to focus. That's crazy. Like it, it's, it's opening up these like different avenues in my mind of like where I want to take this too. Cause I'm thinking about it. The, the, the whole thing with the cars, for example, I, I have a question on the cars and this is from a very, let's, let's take this to a very beginner's level of knowledge of racing period. Um, the car, you take these same cars, if I'm not mistaken to each race, right? They're traveling with you to each race. Yep. Um, but what happens, like, why is it such a big deal if one you lose and two, because because some people would say like okay cool you lost it's like a rodeo you go to the next one next week like you got a chance like and then, so a lot of people have that mindset and they might not mm -hmm. fully understand it so I want to kind of break that down too but when you said like the, the the tire comes off it might ruin the car a little bit does does that crew have to well who, the team do they have to fix that up and use that same car the next week how do you make adjustments to the car or do you just have a replacement car that could potentially come in I mean this is very beginner level that I want to yeah. ask real quick well and some of that depends on the team itself and how well funded they are. Uh, we were pretty much what I would refer to as a bootstrap team. So two, three cars max for us. So anytime you would go to a race, you had your primary car, but you also had a backup car that you pretty much just left in the trailer. Uh, and you, you hoped it stayed there <laughs> no matter what. Uh, but you had your primary race car. And then if anything happened, you would bring out a secondary car. Uh, and if it like in practice, if your guy wrecked in practice, that happened before and you'd use your secondary car. Uh, it's such a big deal, though, because it's such a high money game. So NASCAR is a multiple of what IndyCar costs. Formula One is a multiple of what NASCAR costs. Um, 
so the it's just a big money game. So every position that you finish higher on the in during the course of the race, uh, you get prize money. If you win the pole, so it means that you get to start first. You win money for that. Obviously, you win um, the prize if you. Uh, Finish in the top three, you get the big money, but you get money way on down the line. And that's important. Uh, when you're doing indie, you get show money just for showing up and making the field. Uh, you get, because there, there may be 60, 70 cars that are trying to make that 33 car field. And you make the field, you get prize money just for making the field. Now, uh, higher up you start, the better the prize money or, or the the better the the entry money, as they refer to it, is uh, when you do that. It's just uh, it's it's all money driven from a standpoint of it costs so much. You have to be honed in to the max every single second so that it can make a difference. You finishing one spot higher can make a difference. And the better you run, the more airtime you're going to get. And that's what your sponsors are really looking for. Uh, and for us, that completely changed. I, I had the great privilege of, of winning a uh, newcomer of the year uh, in IndyCar. Uh, so they, they do a lot for drivers, but they all do for uh, crews as well because of my PR work for IndyCar. I, we got our team, not me, but our team got featured several times. Uh, we were on ABC in 99 uh, and Jack Root was our lead um, was the lead announcer for it. Jack's been a, a good buddy of mine. Uh, I hadn't talked to him in years now, but for a long time, about 10 years after racing, he and I stayed in touch. Uh, he knew my uncle very well, uh, which was crazy. And, and so uh, Jack and I had this great relationship. Well, I would pitch story ideas to Jack because the TV networks always, whoever was doing it, not only they they ever have the broadcast just down to the nanosecond, Right. But then something would happen. You know, if you get a rain delay, just like in baseball, you get a rain delay and they're scrambling where how do we fill this time? We can't just show cars just sitting there. Or if you get a, a, a race that's red flagged because of a wreck uh, and it may be 20 minutes while they're cleaning the track up and they're not letting the cars run, uh, even doing practice or caution laps during that time, uh, they've got to find some way to fill that time. So they keep a backlog of stories uh, to be able to jump into should anything like that happen. So I'd go to Jack and I'd, I'd pitch uh, ideas to him. And, and like we did a deal uh, at Indy where uh, we, Jack came in the, the pit, the uh, garage area one day, because back then we were there the entire month of May. Now they only do it two weeks, but uh, you've heard of it referred too likely as the month of May. Uh, that's because up until a few years ago, they literally were there the entire month. And so Jack came in uh, into the garage area one day and, and all of us were sitting around having a frosty. And he's like, well, not one for me. We're like, yeah, you know, you're going to be here, dude. And he's like, so is this like tradition? And I go, yeah, every day when we are finished, there's a Wendy's right down the street. I go down and I get all the crew, uh, we get 16 Frosties every single day, 17 technically. He's got one for the driver. He was the reason we were doing it. And so we go down and get these Frosties. And he's like, are you kidding me? And uh, so we were in Phoenix like two weeks after that. And we there was a about a 30-second story done on us uh, where they brought the ABC folks into the garage area. And we're all doing the Frosties. And, of course, Wendy's got a big plug. Yeah. I was hoping to turn that into a Wednesday sponsorship. Didn't happen. Uh, but, you know, they would come in, uh, came in and did, you know, it was just a, a little human interest thing. And, gee, why is this happening and blah, blah. But, uh, you know, you got extra time and that meant extra exposure for not just the team, but for our sponsors. Wow. That is actually really insightful. I like that. That is that is cool. See, this is when I say. We're trying to deliver a panoramic view on sports. Like we're trying to see it from all around. This is stuff I've never heard. This is why I love this. This is a great conversation. I, I absolutely love it. Talking about race conditions. Yep. So we've seen sometimes tracks like being like you mentioned, even rain, like stuff like that with, with the announcers having to figure out how to like, you know, fill in some dead air and all this stuff. And they need stories, yada, yada. But like in the actual races themselves, 
you know, it might have been raining all week or something and, and stuff. And I've talked to different athletes from different types of sports, you know, that at least when they have, they play on different, you know, you got tennis players who play on different types of courts. You've got football players who have to play in different field conditions. The ones that we typically play outside, they have to deal with that kind of stuff. I'm curious how that affects racing though, because what, to my understanding, they'll shut the race down if it's raining, right? If it's a wet, a wet road or whatever you want to call it, right? Court, wet course, yeah. or whatever. How does that work? Um, so IndyCar runs ovals and they run what's called road courses. Uh, on a road course, they'll actually run a rain tire uh, and can race in the rain. It's a, it's got tread on. It looks very much like a street tire. When you're running ovals, it's a slick. So you that that tire can't get wet. The track can't get wet because there's absolutely no traction on it whatsoever. So racing conditions change literally from day to day. They'll change during the day. Um, temperature has a huge impact on that. Uh, you'll see some years, this year was a very uh, hot Indy 500 weather-wise. Uh, you'll see some years that it may be uh, in the 60s or 70s in May in Indianapolis. And when that happens, uh, you'll usually see two or three cars that somewhere during the course of the race, uh, this happened to a guy here in Dallas by the name of Greg Ray, uh, who was a very prominent IndyCar driver during that time. Uh, and Greg wrecked in one of the Indy 500s uh, coming out of the pit to start the race. Uh, you know, he's, he's coming out to go do his warm up laps and, and had come in and, and they made a small adjustment. He goes back out and he hits the gas a little bit too hard because the track was cold and his tires were cold, spun, hit the wall, done. He didn't get to run a, a single lap that race. Uh, and, uh, it's a huge track condition and, and mainly weather, uh, is gigantic. Now, if there's oil on the track, anything like that, that's usually the providence of uh, the IndyCar uh, organization. They do an incredible job, uh, as does NASCAR, at keeping those things, getting it cleaned up. Uh, if there's any debris, uh, they either bring the cars and run them through the pits for a few laps or halt the race so they can get everything cleaned up. But that weather, uh, that can play havoc with you. Man, how many tires do you guys typically go through, like a rotation of tires when, when a, in a um, race? We typically, like on the 500, we would typically typically take nine sets. So we'd take 36 tires. Uh, in 2000, uh, we literally ran out of tires on our primary car. Our secondary car had uh, blown his gearbox uh, with, I don't know, 50 laps left or something. So we ended up having to go down to our secondary car's pit and get a set of tires to come back because you just, we ran through so many tires that day. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty crazy. It, and uh, that's always a, uh, you know, it depends on a lot of times you will get a specific tire for a specific track. Uh, we, all our tires were provided by Firestone. Uh, and so they'd, they'd come in and they would say, they would deliver tires to you in the garage area and say, these are your tires for this race. Uh, and basically you couldn't buy any. So if the race, if you ran out during the race and you were a one car team, you were just out. Wow. That is crazy, man. So I guess there's some strategy there too. In the worst case Absolutely. scenario, I mean, like if that's the case, you're down to your last, I, I would imagine like the dry, the best place, the best thing to do would be to finish. I would imagine at some point oh, yeah. you get on yep. the, So like, okay, maybe you just slow down. I don't know. Like, not going to win this one, but just finish the race or whatever. I, that's, that's crazy. See what a lot of people don't realize. And, and I was guilty of this myself. I've said it before, Bill is like racers, like the drivers, especially I'm like, what, what's the skill set here? Anybody can drive fast, yada, yada, yada. But there is a lot of strategy involved and there's obviously a lot going on in the, in the pit. And that was the next question I had um, in regards to teamwork too. Cause you had mentioned sometimes some teams have slipped up. There's certain things that happen the teamwork aspect of it, were you ever, did you ever notice like people getting frustrated with one another on a team? Like if one person doesn't do their job, sometimes that can affect the whole team. You know, oh, like yeah. if somebody doesn't drill the tire in, like, you know, lock it in, tire rolls off, um, whatever could, you know, the team gets penalized or it's, it's, a, it's a slower pit stop. Was there frustration amongst people? And how, if so, like, how did you guys overcome that? Like, just like making sure that, and it's almost like a kicker. Like I bet the driver sometimes is like, I'm out here doing all the work and they're, 
they screwed it up. Now I'm behind by five seconds or whatever. Like, I'm sure it's yeah. like that. People are like, it's a kicker. Just kick the ball through the uprights. How I'm out here playing all game. Then you screw the game because you can't kick. Yep. Like, I'm wondering if that's kind of the mindset that happens sometimes. What, well, how do you guys go about stuff like that? A lot of times in the garage area after a race, um, you might have some heated discussion if somebody screwed up. Um, and again, I, I, we were very blessed. Uh, we had uh, very, very good guys uh, as part of our team both years. And so uh, we just had uh, almost none of that. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's just like in any sport. But mainly what would happen is somebody would, would blow it off, get that steam off, and then they're done. Because you had to know we're all in this together. This is a team. And it could be me next time. So I'm not going to be too hard on this guy for screwing up, no matter what, as long as nobody got hurt. I'm not going to be too hard on this guy because that could have been me and it could be me next time. Uh, and, but yeah, they, they, they would get uh, words could be said. Uh, and then after that, everybody kind of calms down. And, and we were fortunate we never had uh, any fisticuffs, uh, but there uh, were teams around that guys would actually get into it, uh, not during a race, but after a race, uh, you're bone tired, uh, you're, you load up the same day after the race is over uh, to start heading back to the shop. And uh, you're, you know, you just wore out and, and you've had a, a very intense three days. Now that's a typical race weekend. Uh, you travel on a day, you've got two days of prep, your uh, race day, and then you're back. But yeah, yeah, it uh, guys could get uh, excited sometimes. Oh, I, I can imagine. I mean, it's the competition feel, but like that's the the beauty and the downside of a team. Like you got to figure out how mm -hmm. to, to communicate in the good and the bad. And yep. uh, I mean, we 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 experience that in all team sports. I just think that's super interesting, especially like you said. Like I mean, it's hot outside sometimes. Sometimes it's not, but it's just like you're there all yeah. day, and it's like you have to be on your best. Like you got to be locked in like the entire time. And then by the end of it, if someone's met, like, I can just imagine, like, it's, that'd be pretty brutal. Now you've been through, you know, a couple seasons of the pit crew. Um, I think that I know the answer probably, but I would like to know your, your favorite, like track, your favorite track, your favorite venue, if you will. Um, and why? Well, in the period bar none, nobody even close. Um, the first time that I did the 500, the way they start the five, and IndyCar does things a little differently, but when a race is about to start, uh, they'll have the cars lined up on the track. Uh, the engine's not running yet. They're, they're just there. The drivers are in the car. And all of us that were members of the team would line up behind the car uh, across the track. Uh, and so while they do the national anthem and then um, almost every race has a flyover of some kind. But that first Indy 500, when there's a quarter of a million plus people in the stands and you're standing there and I had to take a second and go, I'm one of 16 guys on 33 teams and holy cow, here's this little guy from Birmingham, Alabama. Look where I am. And I'm just standing there looking and I'm, I'm looking around and, and all the people. And then the flyover happens. And the flyover was the B2 stealth. And I heard this shh. And I looked up and it was right there. And one of my favorite memories of all time. So I, I had this, uh, I, you and I had a chance to see this earlier, but I wanted to show this to everybody. This is us coming out of the, the 1999 Indy 500. That's our car there, number 42. Number 42. That's, uh, John's Hollinsworth Jr. was our driver. Yes. And that's uh, coming out of turn one. And, and uh, I have a, a tremendous amount, to me, a tremendous amount of um, sports memorabilia. But that's right on up there. That's one of my favorites. So. That's so cool. That is so dope. Oh man, that's awesome. Uh, Bill, so you talked about the Indy 500, the venue, um, and what comes to mind and you talk about the flyover, I was actually like just putting myself in that position. There have been a few times when I go to a, like a, a game, a sporting event, not just playing in one, but like going to one where I've gotten this like sense 
of pride, um, especially with the flyover. For yeah. some reason, I don't know. I feel like racing. It's patriotic. It's a very patriotic. That's exactly the best word to put it. It's very patriotic. And I'm wondering because you you know you played football at a collegiate level uh, for a very reputable university at Alabama, and you know you you've been around and you've just been around sports your whole life. How does indie racing compare when it comes to the patriotism? I guess if, if that's even the word that you could use, like patriotic well, feel. One of the things about race fans, period, uh, race fans, whether it's Indy, NASCAR, drag racing, uh, doesn't matter. They are patriotic Americans. Uh, there's something about, and, and racing is certainly, now NASCAR is an American sport, um, but racing in general has, has been around as long as there have been cars around, certainly not confined to just the U.S., but it is such a patriotic thing. I, I just the the spirit that goes into not only racing and race teams, but that just permeates the fan base of racing uh, is just absolutely incredible. And and uh, it's the kind of thing uh, we all have our favorites. We all have drivers that we hate and blah blah blah. But once it's over, or if anything happens and there's an accident, then all bets are off. We're all together. We're all one. And it is, uh, I absolutely love that about all forms of racing that I've been exposed to. And um, it's just, I don't know why it's so patriotic, uh, but it is. It's incredibly patriotic. I love it, man. I love it. If you could take your time, like the, the couple seasons you were there on the pit crew and what would be the biggest lesson that you learned during that time that you've applied into your life now? I mean, you're a successful businessman yep. uh, running real estate, still doing your thing. And and I want to know what's the biggest thing during the pit crew days that you've been able to take and apply it into your your, your life now? Well, uh, one of the things that I learned, I, I heard Tony Bittenhausen. Now, Tony Bittenhausen is a very famous name around IndyCar. Uh, Tony Bittenhausen uh, was a, an incredible driver, got into an accident. Um, he was driving a midget car, uh, which he wasn't supposed to be doing because he was under contract uh, in IndyCar. But he was uh, ran off to do a little side race, have fun, got in a wreck. Midget cars are open cockpit cars. And the car rolled, got his arm caught, uh, and ended his career. But Firestone hired him as a test driver, and they all their tires they would test at Indy. And so Tony Bittenhausen has driven more laps over the Indy Speedway than anybody alive. So in uh, 99, we brought in a second car for the 500, very common for teams. We, we had a guy, guy named Mike Groff, super guy. Mike did not have a, a ride for the 500 that year. And so he came out to test with us. We hired him uh, to drive our second car in the race. And he was struggling getting up to speed. Uh, you know, you have, you know what the cutoff is. You may not be exactly on, uh, back then we were, the lap time was, you knew you had to do 227 as your average speed for the lap or you, or you weren't going to make the field. Uh, now you might have to go faster than that, depending on how everybody else is doing, but you kind of know based on practice and seeing other teams that this is the number we get above that we're in. Well, our primary guy started 12th. He had no problem. Uh, and Mike was struggling. And so we thought it might be uh, maybe he was a little rusty. So we hired Tony Bittenhausen. And Tony came in, and in all the lessons that uh, we, I got to hear him talk to Mike a lot. But one of the things that he said, it was kind of an offhand comment, um, is uh, he's money equals speed. And I just, I was like, wow. Well, what Tony was talking about was the more money a team has, the the better engineers you're going to be able to have, the better uh, guys, all of your crew members are going to be a little bit better. And again, if you can shave a half a second, that's gigantic. Uh, your engine program is going to be a little bit better. And, and all of that's money. And all of that equates to speed. Well, that I've translated into real estate and really into the consulting business that I run for real estate. And I remind investors of that all the time is money is speed. Uh, and I tie it with a thing that I learned from Tony Robbins. Tony has this fabulous quote uh, that he uses a ton where he says, you take decades and turn them into days. 
Well, that's what money does for you in business. When you can hire a coach, a consultant, a mentor to take their knowledge and basically download it into you for a price, you save all of that time. None of us really have the time to be able to go out and learn our craft, our business with trial and error. We've got to be able to stand on the shoulders of others who have gone before us and can take us by the hand and go, hey, boom, just like any coach in any sport. You don't learn to go hit a baseball. You don't just walk in and figure it out. No, you have somebody teach you how to do that. Now, you don't learn how to be a pitcher. Uh, you don't discover that. You learn that. You learn that from somebody that teaches you how to do that because so much goes into all of that. Well, it's no different in business. And so I, I have kept that statement from Bentonhausen uh, as part of my business for many, many years. Uh, it's part of my everyday life. Money equals speed. Uh, and then I tied in the Tony Robbins part and and it's uh, been incredibly impactful. And And I use that maybe more than anything that uh, that I learned in IndyCar. Money equals speed. I dig that. And the ex entire explanation behind that, I, I hope those who are listening to this, you'll rewind that, like little minute and a half to two minutes of what Bill just said, the money equals speed. Um, I don't know. There's some, For some reason in business and, and just kind of discussing this, in the world, there's this like, from some people, there's a lot of people that just think, oh, money is evil. Money is evil. And I, and I always get kind of frustrated with that. I'm like, no, listen, like you, it can be if it's used for the wrong reasons, but like you, you, you have this negative mindset on money equals speed. I love this. Like I want to take your clip right here and share that with people. And like, you how bet. impactful that can be because it's not like, I, I can't remember if uh, exactly how Floyd Mayweather just said it, but they were like, he's like, um, they say money isn't everything, but legacy can't buy food for the table. You know what I mean? So it's like money is required for a lot of things. Anyways, it's just yeah. kind of the whole concept of money. I love it. So I want to take that money clip that you just money clip. Get it. Yeah. Well, uh, you yeah, certainly have my permission to, and you know, you, you mentioned that, that a lot of people think money's evil. Uh, and you and I uh, have both uh, read and studied the Bible a lot. And I always correct people when uh, when they go, oh, uh, you know, the Bible says, but he says, like, no, it does not. The verse says the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, the love of money is greed. That's very different um, than going out and, and wanting to be a good provider for your family. Uh, wanting to make money because you have that skill set. Uh, so that you can support your church, so that you can support charities, so that you can give to, uh, as the Bible says, widows and orphans. Uh, but it's very specific. It's the love of money uh, that is the root of all evil, not money uh, itself. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, that that conversation happens several times a year. It's amazing how many people misquote that. So. Absolutely. And I, dude, I love that piece of it too. Thank you for sharing that because that's just so, so impactful. And, that, and one thing I've always appreciated, appreciated about you, Bill, is like in your work that you do, um, you give back. That's one of your basic like principles, like is like giving back. Like I, I remember listening to a podcast of yours and talking about like the 10 by like you give back. Like that's, yep. that's the thing. It was when you make it, you give it back. Like that's whole, that's part of the process. Um, big fundamental like piece to what you do which yeah. speaks volumes to your character. And I think that's awesome. So like for people who are like, oh, money's evil, whatever. Okay, yeah, listen up. Go go meet Bill Barnett and like, let me tell you what that's all about. Well, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I know you have an upcoming guest, Mark Victor Hansen, dear friend of mine. And Mark taught me something many, many years ago that has stuck with me. Um, and Mark has a great book out called The Miracle of Tithing. And, and I give away uh, two or 300 copies of that book a year. Uh, it's a, what we call it a, a pocketbook. It's a little small book, but it is so powerful. Uh, but years ago, before I ever had any monetary success, and I had just gotten to know Mark, I met Mark in the, the mid 70s, and I had just gotten to know him and was kind of just getting into the business world on my own. And we were talking about tithing. And I was like, well, Mark, I, I you know, my tithe doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't change anything because I make so little money at the time. And, and he goes, well, you know, there's more to tithing than just giving of your money. Uh, you could do an idea tithe and that be 
just as impactful or more impactful. And I was like, wow, I never thought about that. And he goes, you know, when you give somebody your time, you're tithing your time. Your ideas have value as well. So it's not just money, but you learn that concept of nobody. Uh, there's a um, there's a guy out there who is uh, very successful, super guy. Um, I, I have uh, some issues with one of the things that he promotes uh, about himself uh, a lot, uh, which is self-made. And I'm like, dude, the more you think you are self-made, the probably more people that have helped you in life. Uh, at some point, you get to uh, this point in life, hopefully, uh, you get to this point where you start to recognize how incredibly blessed you are um, for me, for you, for anybody. Um, and it doesn't have to be monetary success, but you look at, uh, you know, we woke up this morning and, and we woke up uh, in the greatest country that exists on the planet that's ever existed, as screwed up as everything is right now, this is still the greatest country in the world. I thank God every day that I was blessed by him to be born an American. And uh, being in Texas helps a little bit too. Uh, so you get, uh, you, you start recognize those things. You know, I, I'm, I'm in incredibly good health. Um, uh, I'm uh, 174 years old. Uh, I know I don't look it, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you start to realize those things that, man, there's just so much to be grateful for. And as you do that, you recognize things just like you. I'm, you know, I'm very grateful for the relationship that you and I have. And I, you, you look at those things and you see how many people in your life and in your circle of influence whether they're in your circle or you're in their circle, uh, how many people have had an impact? Um, you know, Mark, and, and I don't even know if Mark remembers this story or not. I would have no speaking career if it weren't for Mark Victor Hansen. Uh, Mark brought me out and put me on stage for the very first time. Um, and then not only didn't stop by giving me my first event, he created my real estate coaching business on the spot. Um, so uh, I don't know if we have time for that. I'll tell you that story sometime. But. <laughs> that's that's so cool. Like and and yeah, just thinking as this as the conversation evolves here, and we've we've talked about it. I I too like Bill have. I, I mean, I lived in Brazil for two years and I have a massive appreciation for the country which we live in. I'm just going to say that. Not saying that Brazil is this dump or anything like that, but we do live in the greatest country. I want everybody to remember that. Um, it kind of goes back to the, like, that's why I was talking about patriot, like the, the whole patriotic feel of, of racing and sports and all that stuff. That's why I'm like so passionate about that because I've seen it from a different perspective. I too, um, I think anybody who's made it, no one's self-made. Um, it doesn't matter what you believe in. And if, if you don't believe in a higher power or whatever, like it, you're not self-made. I'm sorry to tell you. Um, there's a lot of things there. And yeah. I just, I think that's awesome. That's why I get along with you, Bill, because you got similar uh, morals and, and ethics and everything as I do. And I, and I just, I vibe with that. I think it's super, super cool. And it's uh, you're an inspiration. That's you, you motivate me to well, be better. You. And I think it's awesome. Um, as we wrap it up, Bill, it's the, the 200th episode. I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you so much for the, the friendship and then the, opportunity to speak with you. And I want to give you an opportunity here to, since we have touched base on your, your business ventures and so forth, let the listeners know, you know, where they can find you. If they're interested in learning more about what you have to offer outside of sports, like what do you got to offer and uh, where can we find you? You know, uh, I do a, a webinar every Thursday night where I'm in real estate investing. I talk about real estate coaching, real estate investing. And so there's a, a website. If you'd ever like to join one of our webinars, it's secrets to cash now secrets to cash now dot net. Uh, so I use dot net because of net worth and net assets. Uh, so secrets to cash now dot net. Jump on and uh, jump uh, in and join one of our webinars one Thursday night. I do a webinar every Thursday night. Topics will vary from time to time. But every Thursday night, you can go to that address and find out what was going to be talked about that week. Uh, it's a private uh, webinar, so you have to uh, sign up to be able to get the link for it. But that's how people can uh, get in and learn a little bit more about what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Heck yeah. Secrets to cash now dot net. Yep. Go check it out. Um, I'll put the link here in the description for you guys. Go sure. listen to uh, Bill on a, on a Thursday night. Learn 
some more about how to make some money. Nine o'clock like, Eastern. Nine Eastern. There we go. That's perfect. I was about to ask that, but I assumed it would probably be on the website as well. Some details yeah. on the oh, event. Yeah. But there you guys go. Again, Bill, thank you so much for joining me, my brother. Like this has been an amazing time learning about your journey as a member of a pit crew for indie racing. Like that is super, super cool. It's the first time on the show. So like we, that we've talked about that. So thank you so much, man. And uh, I appreciate it for all the listeners you out Love there. You, appreciate you. And hey, looking forward to uh, seeing you live in September. Oh, let's go. I cannot wait. All the listeners out there, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Rate and review it on Apple Podcasts and share it with your friends and family. We'll be coming to you next week with another interview. Guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of my show. Now, if you could go and do me a favor, head over to iTunes, give me five stars, and leave me a review. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your support.